Hello, Strat fans. You're listening to Stratology, the show for and by students of Stratomatic. I'm your host, Jimmy James, and on the show today, we have former professional baseball player Gail Hopkins. So, sit back, grab your cards and dice, and let's roll! Today on Strat Chat, I have an amazing, amazing, special thing today. We have a great guest, Dr. Gail Hopkins. Now, I, I should have a little disclaimer here. Gail was the very first professional baseball player I ever met. He was also the very first person I ever got an autograph from. So I think it is amazingly fitting that you were also the very first professional guest we've ever had here on Stratology. Thank you so much for being here, Gail. My pleasure. <laughs> a, a little bit about Gail. Gail played um, college ball at Pepperdine. Uh, he came up through the White Sox organization. He played uh, his year in Lodi. He batted three fifty eight. He played then, uh, came up in 68 for the White Sox, played for them till uh, 1970. In 1970, he hit 286. And there's always a, a, a story that my mom tells me because he really tore up the first half of that season. And she has a, a um, clipping from the newspaper for the, I think it's the day I was born. And you were, I think, had the top batting average in the American League at that day. So I've seen that clipping a hundred times in my life, I think. Uh, he then played for the Royals for 71 through 73. Uh, he came up in 74 as a late season call-up for the Dodgers. Then he went and played in Japan from 75 to 76 for the Hiroshima Carp led them, or, or, or was a big part, of their first Japanese World Series. Uh, 1976, he was, uh, I think you were fourth in the league in batting at 329. 77, he played uh, for the Nankai Hawks. And then I think, if I've, I've seen the World Series ring, but I can't remember the year. It's 1980, correct, Gail? Your World uh. Series? Uh, well, no, the World Series was 74 with the Dodgers. Oh, it was, oh, it was 74. It was 74. Okay. And then um, I, I also read something that, um, that uh, I thought was very interesting. And it, it was a possible, but uh, in an article about Gale, it said he's probably the only pro ball player with both an MD and a PhD. So just... What a, what an amazing career, and uh, th yeah, like I said, again, thank you so much for being here, Gail. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Okay. So, After all, I, I mean, I knew you before you were you. Yeah, exactly. There, that's what I said. There's I knew, no doubt you were the first knew, professional ball player I ever met. <laughs> I knew you when you were in different parts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why do you say that? I wasn't even a twinkle in my daddy's eye yet. No, <laughs> uh, so, you know, one of the one of the reasons I wanted to have you on was um in in Stratomatic, one of the questions that they asked us this year for the card and dice for new sets is they're talking about coming out with a Japanese uh all-star or hall of fame set. And it kind of made me look into it. And on the computer game, there's lots of old uh, seasons that you can play. I think you can play 69, uh, 73. I was looking to see if one of your seasons was there. So I may have to call the company and say, hey, can we add, can we add 75, 76? But, uh, then the, but they have quite a few seasons for the Japanese league in, in the computer game. I thought that was really cool. And I, I thought I was going to want to ask you, how that all came about, you know, how, you know, you're kind of in that first wave of, of, of players to go to Japan from America and kind of how did that all come about? 
Well, uh, actually, you know, baseball in Japan is has been around for quite a while. It was it was uh, there before uh, World War II, and in fact, uh, one of the I am told uh, by people who were related to other people and have seen pictures, uh, you know, of that were taken in the 1930s uh, when they started professional baseball in Japan because uh, they were somehow enamored with uh, Babe Ruth and uh, Lou Gehrig and all of the American, uh, these American baseball players. And baseball has... Uh, it, the game itself, uh, from a strategic uh, execution kind of a perspective, is something that appealed to the Japanese mind, and and so they they started professional teams in the 1930s, and invited uh, American professional players who came who went to Japan, and in those days it was by boat. Uh, after the World Series was over, but you got to remember the World Series used to end at the beginning of October, mm -hmm. and uh, and so uh, uh, they had uh, players uh, like Lou, uh, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, uh, Jimmy Fox, Connie Mack, and all of those guys uh, went to Japan uh, along with uh, a number of other people on a, on a series of trips. Uh, that went over and played baseball against the Japanese. The Japanese then suspended baseball during the war because it was identified as an American game uh, or related to uh, American games, you know. And so uh, it wasn't until uh, about 1950 that they started baseball up again as a profession. And uh, you you mentioned Lodi, and I and you and I, I talked about it once briefly. But actually, Lodi had a connection to the beginning of baseball in Japan because uh, the year I played in Lodi, I had, I had been optioned to the Cubs organization, and I was I was in the minor leagues, and mm -hmm. this was also during the Vietnam War, and so uh, I had I was optioned to the Cubs. And the Cubs then, uh, I was there because uh, Lodi needed a catcher uh, mm -hmm. at that level. And because they had a guy named uh, Rudolph, who eventually big leagues for the, for Chicago. And so Ken was in, in school. And so they needed somebody to until he got there. And so uh, our general manager for the Cub, for the Lodi team was a guy named Cappy Harada. And Cappy Harada bit, had been on the, the general staff of General MacArthur at the end of World War II. And Cappy was an American from the Central Valley from California. He was a Nisei, second, uh, second generation. And, but he, uh, uh, he was also on MacArthur's staff. And Cappy was a real go-getter. Uh, he understood there was an opportunity, and it turns out that they, around 1950, uh, he was able to help with a whole bunch of others to get the Japanese professional baseball going again, and he was the first manager for the Tokyo Giants for, mm. I think it was just for like one year, but they also brought, he also brought over a guy named Wally Yonamini. Uh, Wally Yonamini was born in Maui, and... Uh, and was a, an American, Nisei. Uh, and Wally had played AAA baseball and had played football for the 49ers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but he, he went to Japan around 1950. And he was, I, I considered Wally, my personal view is Wally was the most successful American to ever have played in Japan. I mean, he was there for 25 to 30 years as either a player or a coach. He hit 311 in his playing career, and he played for the Tokyo Giants, but he was an American, and it was an, it, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a white guy, and white guys and black guys in Japan are easy to pick up, but, the, you know, Wally looked like everybody else, except he wasn't. Mm -hmm. He was a, he was an American, and so he had a pretty tough time at the beginning, but his, his athletic ability put it, 
put him, brought him through. And so by the time I showed up in 1975, uh, the, uh, uh, each each team and there were there are only twelve teams in Japan, and three of them in each league played in Tokyo. So you you spent one quarter of your season in Tokyo. What wow. didn't matter which league you were in. Uh, the Tokyo area was enormous. You know, yeah. it's a, like thirty five million people, and so yeah. so uh, uh, we. Uh, but we we all uh, by the time we got there, there were the twelve teams, and there were two foreigners. Uh, not every team had Americans. Some of them had some South Americans or Koreans or uh, guys from Taiwan. They were all considered foreign. Uh, and so each, but each team could be foreigners, and uh, and so then I came along then in 1975, and uh, I got to join the CARP. And I'll give you a chance to respond to all that, but but I, I can tell you how I got there. And, yeah, uh, but definitely. You know, I, I don't think a lot of Americans understand the size of some cities in uh, in in Asia. I mean, and even all the way, you know, I was in Kiev, and none of my friends, I don't think, understand the size. And, and Kiev's only eight million. You know, Tokyo yeah. is even another world than that. Oh, you you never get out of you know you go to Tokyo and you never get out of town. I mean, you yeah. just you get on the get on the train and you just you, you can ride a train from one end of the town to the other and you're for an hour and you're still in it. I mean, it's just yeah. big. It, it, it's you know, to have hell half the teams be there and have the population to support half the teams. You know, that's right. That's on a whole nother level than Cubs, White Sox. Yankees, oh. Mets. It's a, it's another level. Yeah, I mean the whole uh, Chicagoland area. When I lived there, and we had the two ball clubs, the Cubs and the White Sox. I mean there there was something like eight million people in the greater Chicago area, and uh, like eleven million, I think, at that time in the state. Well, I mean you in, in here just in Tokyo, you had you had uh, all those clubs, and and when you got down toward Osaka. Uh, you had uh, let's see, what three teams in the Osaka area or four? Uh, then uh, you know Hiroshima was a country town. Uh, Fu there was a place called Fukuoka, where eventually, uh, which is down on Kyushu Island, the southernmost island, uh, and that they had a team there. And they've had some teams in other places like Sendai. Now they have a team up in Sendai, and they've tried to spread it out a little bit. But their their philosophy on well, it's not a philosophy. Their business approach uh, on their teams was different. Here, most of the clubs are owned by a organization or a family or something like that. There, most of the clubs were owned by some business, and then and the clubs, the baseball teams, are used as an extension of the business to help the business. Mm. The Tokyo Giants are called the Yomiuri Giants. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're a newspaper, and oh. so so the Giants would play ball games where they wanted to increase the. Uh, they would go. Everybody in Japan, all the teams in Japan, play uh, about six country games. So you go play in some town. You go play in some place like Lodi or Stockton, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, and so you go in there, and instead of having a stadium that'll hold. 55,000 people, you know, you play before 15,000 or 20, whatever they can get in a stadium. And, uh, but that's, uh, uh, they're an extensions of the company. My club, Hiroshima, when I, when I was there, that club was owned by Toyo Kogio Industries, Mazda Cars. Oh. Uh, and so, uh, and Nankai is owned by the train line. It was owned by a train line. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of them. There's a number of them that are owned by train lines, and so you, they try to play their country games along the train lines. Oh, very cool. So, smart. anyways, yeah, yeah, but yeah. that's really different. smart. You know that about the Giants. I had always thought it was because it was a, a region of Tokyo. You know, because I knew there were so many oh. teams there. I always was like, oh, when they switched from the Tokyo Giants. Oh, that's got to be because that's the part of town they were in. You know, living in Vienna, 
every oh, section yeah. of town has its own name because it used to be a city. So, yo, yeah. it, I used to live in Leopoldstadt, like right across from the canal from the first district. Yeah, so no. I thought, oh, this is a part of Tokyo. No, they and uh, they're they actually. Uh, I'm not sure of the. Their uniforms actually looked like the to, like similar to the Giants' yeah. uh, uniforms, uh, uh, but uh, no, they're uh, they were right there the, uh, and they played when I was there. Played at a place called Karakuen Stadium, but now I think they play in Tokyo Dome. And uh, uh, but at that time, it was a, a, a stadium that held fifty five thousand people. And one of the things that was I found truly amazing. Uh, when I I went there after 1974 uh, because uh, I went there temporarily. Uh, I was I had decided to quit baseball uh, in 1974 and uh, start medical school, uh, but uh, through a series of thing opportunities, we ended up going to Japan. And I thought I'd be there for about one year, but after uh, but I ended up. Because that was my plan. Actually, I'd be there for one year, and then I was going to be in med school full time. Uh, but uh, the um, when I left the Dodgers, uh, the point I was trying to make is when I was with the Dodgers uh, in '74, uh, we broke the major league attendance record that year. Uh, we drew uh, uh, two point. 71 million people and uh we did that in uh 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 82 home games we didn't play uh uh, no 81 home games we didn't play any double hitters in los angeles we played all single games and we drew 2.7 million now that broke uh the cleveland cleveland had held uh, the major league attendance record from when Bob Lemon and, and Feller and those guys were there, I think it was I think it was 1954. They drew 2.6 million, mm-hmm. and so that had been a record that nobody got close to for a long time. And and so we came along in Los Angeles. We had a really good team. It was hot in L.A. You know, everybody liked it, and so we had we had great crowds, and we played all single games. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I go I went to here to Japan and <clears throat> start playing for Hiroshima and Hiroshima had a di- history up until that year uh, you know they had finished last or next to last I think it was 26 out of 27 or 25 out of 26 years they had finished third once in 1968 and other than that uh, their the Hiroshima carp uh, was the name of the, the the name of the team and the joke around the cab would you say how are the carp and the guy would say the driver would say they are on the bottom like they always are mm-hmm. uh, because that's where the carp always are on the bottom mm-hmm. feeders and so the carp had, had always done poorly but then we had a great season and of course we went ahead and won won the central league championship but uh, the uh, the Stadium in Hiroshima held 32,000 people, 30, 32 to 35. The one in Tokyo where the Giants played held 55,000 people. When we played against, even though we were a last place team at the beginning of the season, whenever we played in Tokyo the, and you played before the Giants, the stadium was full. That season, but when the season was finally over, the Tokyo Giants finished almost 30 games behind us. Wow. And we when we won it, they drew 3.05 million people at home in and they did it in 65 games. Wow. That's right. And every in the league, every team in the league drew over we drew in our little stadium drew 1.4 million. And every other team drew more with a couple teams, uh, Nagoya and uh, and the other Osaka team drawing something like two and a half million. And so, you know, when you start talking about baseball and it's an American game and all that, it's actually a Japanese game. Mm-hmm. They they just go wild over it. It's a great game. 
and, and uh, all foreigners, I don't know if you know this, we all look alike. My mm -hmm. friends, we would make jokes, you know, I'd make, we'd make jokes about them. You guys have squatty little noses. You guys are all big eyes and, and big noses. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is the players talking and laughing and having a good time with each other. And, but the point is, the other thing is, I, someone would say, well, you guys all look alike. And, and they'd say, no, you guys all look alike. And so, you know, and, and of course, I never, never started realizing until they said, we do have kind of big noses. And, and so, anyways, the, but the, the point was, even though all the foreigners kind of look alike, when you go there, when we went to these little towns or play, after halfway through the first season, uh, as a ball player, as a as one of the uh, professional players in Japan, you couldn't go much of any place without being recognized. And there are there were like a hundred ball games every night. A hundred ball games were televised on their televisions. There are multiple stations carrying the same game. And and they they're televised all over the nation. It is an incredible sport uh, in Japan. Yeah, um, it, it 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 and sumo dominate. Yeah, it's uh, we we don't understand the global aspect of baseball. I don't think very much here. Um, you know, if 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 you're in Venezuela, you're oh, yeah. in Puerto Rico, you're in the Dominican Republic. It rivals soccer in all those places. I mean, maybe not quite in Venezuela, but it does in Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic, for sure. We even well, have a regular listener in Japan, at least one. So, uh, well, hello to you out there. Well, uh, konnichiwa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, I mean, baseball in America, has, I mean, the major leagues, has become a, a, a Caribbean and South American game. It's dominated by uh, Latin ball players right now. And, and of course, uh, uh, Otani. I mean, it's not just Otani. I mean, the, it has become a, a world game uh, in the major leagues. And, and it's one of the really good and neat things about it. So that you kind of do have a World Series almost where you nowadays, where you got a quality guys coming in from all over the country, all over the world to play the game. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, it was the, where the think I think the year uh, the year that it kind of opened people's eyes a little bit is the year that the Netherlands did so good. Where then when they had a uh, Profar and uh, oh, yeah. uh, what's the shortstop for Cl uh, Cleveland? They had him at the same time, but they were, uh, uh, you know, yeah, some of the guys were from the Netherlands and some of the guys were from the islands, but you know, nobody thought of. Netherlands and baseball before that. No, no baseball is it's a it's a, a global game now, and and of course it, it all and at some point who knows if you get other parts of the world playing in China or some other places, you, it, who knows what will happen with the quality of the game and the comp competitive levels. I mean, it's uh, the game's gotten bigger and faster and stronger. Yeah, oh, definitely. A lot of changes recently, you know, especially in, well, both in the way they, they play and and uh, in in terms of the longevity, because there's a lot of things that happen to guys' arms now that were, uh, they were career ending just oh, yeah, 30, right. 30 years ago, you know. Uh, I coach with a guy who's one of the, literally one of the top prospects that ever came out of Stockton. And, you know, Stockton had a lot of good ball players back at the time of Von Hayes and Sprague and Eddie Gardato. And here was a kid who hit better than Von Hayes and pitched better than Gardato and all that type of stuff, but blew his arm out as a senior. And we never saw him at, you know, and never even, never even got to take advantage of the scholarships. And today he'd be rehabbed. A lot of, well, there's a lot of things that we know, you know, both medically you know, uh, we can handle things in terms of medicine and sports medicine. Uh, and uh, there's always that, and then, uh, which which helps. Uh, but the guys also are trained differently. I mean, uh, you know, when I played, we didn't do weight training. We didn't, uh, in fact, uh, the coaches would give you nothing but trouble when you try to do weights because... Uh, we, they would cause you to bulk up and get slow, you know. Well, that's not the case. Actually, that's quite the contrary. Uh, we know now, I mean, that uh, physical training and stuff, and, uh, and, and they work you around. But, of course, 
uh, there's a lot of incentives for doing it now. I mean, financially, uh, you know, the when I was with Kansas City, uh, when I was with the Royals, the the team salary was eight hundred and seventy five thousand uh, dollars. That was the team salary. Uh, yeah, you know, and so now. Uh, what's the minimum salary in the big leagues? Yeah, I, so I, there's seventy five, seven hundred fifty thousand, something like that. There's there's a incredible incentives for for players to stay in, get in shape, and stay in shape, and take care of themselves in ways that we didn't do during the winter. We would have to go get a job. A lot of us would get jobs during the winter. Uh, you know, these the fellows now are blessed with enough where if they take care of themselves, they shouldn't have to do that. So it's, uh, I mean, they may want to think about what they're going to do after ball, but uh, it, it's the, the incentives and the playing, there's a lot of aspects of the game that are very different now. Uh, you know, the balls are loaded, the, the parks are better for hitting. Uh, there's, they've changed the games, changed the game around. Uh, the way people pitch is so different. Yeah. yeah now I mean, you throw as hard as you can every pitch. Where you're never you're never looking to save something for the fifth, sixth, seventh inning now. Well, yeah, they've got a they've got they're they're married to this metrics and things like that now, and so we'll see we'll see how it all goes. You know. Okay. Well, let's take a short break, and when we come back, I want to uh, talk a little bit about some strat stuff and and and, and a little cool thing for that, and and maybe a little bit more about uh, a little bit about Japan. Yeah, I, I do. I, I was told by your mom to uh, make sure that I give you some strategy for life here. I don't know if you can. Uh, okay. Happy wife, happy life. Yeah. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm also like you, am married to an incredible go getter. That each, you either. Go along for the ride or you get left behind. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> okay, now, Gail, one of the coolest things and, and the second reason why I wanted to have you on was because uh, on the Strat 365 online game, they have limited run or the shoot, limited run sets. And one of the sets they just had was 1969. And I played three different... Uh, three different seasons, you know, all 162 games that it plays three a night. And let's see, let's see. I've got your, your stat lines right here from the three leagues. So it's just using your 69 card. The first time you batted 265, 345 on base, 488 uh, slugging, 19 homers, 65 RBIs. We were playing in six stadium. So, a good park, a good park for you to hit the ball out of. <laughs> uh, the second time, uh, well, you hit 284, three, 384 on base, 439 slugging, 15 homers, 50 RBIs. Last time was 283, 366 on base, 419 slugging, 13 homers, 61 RBIs. So uh, it was really awesome that uh, to see how, uh, you know, it was really special for me, and I'll tell you a little secret. The uh, if you won the big Barnstormers tournament that used the all-time great set this last year, they just came out with the ninth version of it. And if you won, you got to add some cards. Now nah, I got a hundred and twentieth, but if I had won, you would have been in the set, my friend. <laughs> you were going to be my number one card. But I think I was going to go with the nineteen seventy card. You know. I you gotta you gotta raise your standards a little bit here. Today. Oh well, dude, you gotta have you know, all the different types of guys in there. You know, uh, you know, I don't have to. Uh, we did really well. We made the playoffs two out of three times, and we were just right there. We didn't we didn't win the World Series any, but we we got pretty good yeah. there, Gail. Yeah, that's good. So, um, but but you know that one it brought up a very interesting thing to me because. I had grown up, and, and even seeing it on, on some of your, your baseball cards, it always said first base catcher. But I was looking through in the pros, you almost always played first base. Well, I played, yeah, I, I played first. I caught, and I played third once, yeah. uh, and, you know, and uh, the, and I, uh, w 
I was often the third catcher on a club uh, because you usually have to carry three catchers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, w with me being an infielder uh, and a designated hitter, uh, because that came in halfway through my uh, time in the American League, uh, the, that by, by me being on the club as an infielder, that also uh, allowed the club to have uh, a third catcher and sort of doubled up that position where they might otherwise have to carry three catchers and actually have guy, three guys that only would catch. Uh, and so I was, I was doing you know, more than one thing. And then, of course, the DH came along. And so my role often, once the DH came along, would be flipping from one game I might be DHing, another game I might play third. Uh, I mean, I'm not play third, but well, that that actually did happen. But I mean, but uh, but play uh, first uh, or sometimes catch. So, mm -hmm. but, and then when I when I wasn't catching or wasn't playing, I could be in the bullpen, doing the bullpen work that had to be done. Mm -hmm. So it, I was able to keep busy that way. Mm -hmm. I was just I was just surprised that you weren't used as a catcher more because. Uh, you hit well against righties your whole career. You know? Yeah, well, I, I mean, in a, in a different age, you know, if I was thinking, well, you know, Stratomatic, that's the game that Billy Bean was playing as a kid that in, in some ways kind of brought in this whole statistical baseball, you know, as if people like it or don't, this game it had some influence because it influenced him and, you know, all, all the players that played, Cal Ripken and Keith Hernandez and Doug Glanville, all those guys that played, you know, it's, it's affected the game. And I thought, you know, now even more looking at your stats, you know, I, I you would have been, you would have been a right-handed hitting catcher for half the teams in the league would have loved to have you. Well, we, when I came up, actually, I, when I was with the White Sox, we had one, our, one, our catcher what had played in the all-star game, uh, our we had, uh, uh, and, and there was a, a, a group of us that came up together with the White Sox, uh, Bill Melton, Carlos May, a guy named Ed Herman mm -hmm. and I, and we all sort of came up together. And while Ed Herman was a left-hand, I mean, a, a left-hand hitting uh, mm -hmm. and and I, they had me to play first and Carlos in the outfield, Bill Melton, they put it third base. And so... They had they had kind of worked a plan through the first part of my career, and then when I went to and I was traded to Kansas City, they they traded for Jerry May, who had been catching in for mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, and was a pretty good catcher. And yeah. they and so we had a, and we had also had a left-handed hitting catcher on that club, a guy named Ed Kirkpatrick, who would catch yeah. some of the time. And of course, Ed played in other positions too in the outfield, but. Uh, and Ed, well, anyways, uh, so yeah, uh, I don't, I was relatively happy with my, uh, job and you know, and I was able to play ball and do that stuff and make a living at it. And, uh, and I was going to school at the same time. So yeah. all of it, well, it, it kind of, it kind of, you got to be a little bit of a, a Swiss army knife for them. Well, yeah, yeah. You make yourself useful and, uh, cause you never know what's going to happen. And that's, I mean, that's how uh, they traded for me in Kansas City. And uh, and then uh, 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 Bob Lemon was the manager. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, Bob, I, Bob, I really liked Bob. I thought, I thought he was uh, a real player's manager. And he was uh, probably, I thought he was the, the best manager I played for when I was in the big leagues. Uh, and, uh, uh, he, uh, he, I remember he came up to me and he said, look, I know you hit, Gail, I know you hit 386 last year and this and that. You just stay ready because, uh, uh, you know, we got a, I've got a guy at first base now. You know, he hit 30 home runs last year and drove in 100 runs. And, and so just be ready. I'll, we'll find out, you know, I'll try to get you in and do this and that. So I said, well, you know, that's, that's the way life is. And so I... Uh, uh, after we were halfway through the season, uh, the other fella at first hadn't driven in a game-winning run halfway through the season. 
and uh, we went to Detroit, and I just went into the locker room one day into Detroit. We were halfway, we were at the halfway point or right at it, and and I walked in and uh, and just to get dressed and go out and work out and just stay ready like usual. And Lemon came up to me in the locker room and just said, "Hey, Hop, you're uh, playing first and hitting uh, hitting fourth, and you're going to stay there until you can't do it." And uh, 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 he, and he gave a couple other reasons why he was doing it, and he moved the other fella to the outfield. And inning, I drove in three runs, because uh, because Amos Otis, Paul Shaw, and uh, Fred Potek were always yeah. on base at that point. All three of them were hitting three hundred, or and Shaw and and Potek ended up stealing something like forty and fifty bases. That I mean, they were always on base. Yeah, and and uh, and so the first, my first at bat, I hit a triple to left field, and all three of them scored. And so by the time uh, I, you know, I drove in something like forty-seven runs in the second half of the season, and we won a lot of games. We 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 competed with Oakland until uh, until the middle of September. So, but and, and that Oakland team was full of future were. Hall of Famers. They were good. <laughs> they they win and they did, and they went on. You know, they they won the series three years in a row. Yeah, and they actually beat us eventually when I was with the Dodgers. Yeah, and that was. I mean, they had they had a lo- they were loaded. But anyways, the point of all that is what I'm saying is that you know you you take the opportunities that come your way, and in baseball, uh, lots of uh, lots of places along the way, uh, I. Uh, my break came when somebody got hurt and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, by the time they get back, they get back, then I would be doing well. And that's sort of where the story ended for them. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and and I think, I think the position of catcher changed a little bit from the, from the sixties to, to the nineties of what you were expecting from your catcher a little bit too. Yeah, well, they, they actually the whole they, there were there was a, a fundamental change uh, in catching from uh, the the 50s and into the 60s. And that during that period of time, uh, there was actually there were a bunch of changes uh, that took, were slowly taking place in the equipment. Uh, because the when I first came up and first started catching, the catcher's mitt was a mitten with a where you caught the ball right in here, and as as by the time you got to the end of the uh, 1960s, almost all the catchers were using a web kind of first, almost like a first baseman's glove, like they are now. The catcher's gloves, and and so the 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 techniques in catching uh, even changed during that that period of time. Whereas with the old gloves, you had to use two hands all the time to catch because the ball was you're catching it in a the glove was kind of round and and I mean the glove it was really a, called a mitt. And it was, uh, you know, the pocket was right here on your index finger. And uh, uh, that's where you had to catch it and keep the ball in there. And so the techniques of catching was different. Now, the guys would, st- uh, you, you know, you never hear about it because you weren't alive then. But, uh, but the, now the guys would catch with one hand. That was a big deal for, uh, you know, guys didn't used to catch with one hand. And so they start catching with one hand and here and pull and, and having the, where they'd pull their hand from here, pull it over here. And you can do that with a web glove, but you couldn't do that with the old style gloves. So, yeah, there were some fundamental changes in catching that took yeah. place during that time. Well, and I think even some of the guys that you see, you know, when I'm playing even some of the older sets and you take a look at what was expected offensively from a catcher yeah. compared to what was expected off defensively for a catcher later on to where if you could get a guy that could be a real good hitter against one hand and be a catcher, man, that was a good thing. You know, the, the, the days of Brad Ausmus and where dude, Pudge was one of the only guys that could play defense and hit, you know, there weren't very many of those guys and those, the Benito Santiago's and the, and the Brad Ausmus's and the, those, all the, that range of guys. Yeah. They were there for a different reason than Johnny Bench and Batty and those guys. Yeah, there, I mean, there have always been, uh, you know, there you can always find in history catchers that would be both 
pretty good defensively and good hitters. I mean, there's, that's always one of the match things you're trying to do is you have a catcher who can uh, throw every runner out and can do the, you know, get the pitches for the pitcher and then one that hits leads the league in hitting and RBIs. Those are the guys you're looking for. <laughs> yeah, well, there, you know? there haven't been too many of them in the history of the league. No, you don't. You don't find too many of them. Oh, you know that's 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 one of those things when you get that special guy. The, there's a reason why Johnny Bench was always a red. There was a reason why Buster Posey was always a giant. No yeah, matter what they asked for, they were going to get it because they were there's there wasn't a replacement. Now John John was a was a great ball player. I mean he could do it all. A uh, bench. And, oh, and so yeah, it's 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 a uh, he he really yeah uh, uh, what, what up to, up to his point there was nobody almost like him I don't think. No, he uh well he when I I played against him when he was 18 years old. We played against each other in the Florida State League. And I I have to tell you that I was the all-star catcher, not John. And Yeah. Yeah, but that's only because he was only there for a month and a half. <laughs> well, hey, you got to you got to take it when you can get it. When, oh, yeah, uh, man. when I just did a, a couple years ago when I played the creature in Young Frankenstein, uh, I had to gain so much weight for that role and I had to wear 6-inch platform boots to tap dance in. And there was a young kid, I love working with him, but at, he was away at Disney, working at Disney for a couple of months when there was auditions, so he came back in a couple of weeks later, but the kid's an amazing dancer, and he's six foot five. There is no wow. way I would have had that role if he had been in town, but, you know, it, it, I knocked it out of the park, thank goodness, and it was one of my best ones. But yeah, yeah. Dude, there's no chance I would have been given that opportunity if he had been in town. <laughs> so well, that 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 brings up the deal, you know, timing's everything. Uh, it's uh, one of the things. That's I, I I I'm the perfect example of that with with music and with theater. In every case, I just ended up being at the right place at the right time, and not just because I was, you know, better than that other guy. I just happened to have good. Very good luck, in, and and sometimes not only in the in the circumstance, but also in the people that you're around. Yeah, well, you, you know, there's uh, uh, there's an you know you hear there's a saying in that we used and we used in baseball a lot is you make your breaks. You hear people get talk about getting breaks. One of the things you do is you stay in shape. You make sure you have an opportunity of doing something, and then uh, when when the opportunity comes up, then you execute. But, you know, you, you kind of make your breaks by staying ready and putting yourself in positions. Yes. And if that doesn't, if it doesn't happen, you still, then you haven't done anything wrong by doing it that way. And you're better off than slouching around. But yeah. that's how you get, uh, you know, you, you, you want to be both good and lucky. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, exactly. Yeah. I know a lot of musicians who are better than the guys that are on the radio. But yeah. they just weren't in the right place at the right time. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. You know? But, but like you said, guys, you I have knew. to be willing. You have to be willing to grab that opportunity when it comes because it probably won't come around again. Yeah, well, that that's right. There are a lot of things that you have an opportunity to do at once and that or twice. And if you take advantage of it, it's there for you. If you don't, it goes on to someone else or something else. So, but, but you're right. I mean, you uh, do the best you can and then take advantage of what you get. Well, thank you so much for being with us here, Gail. I, I appreciate it. And like I said, it's so fitting that you are, were the first professional guest. I, I thank you so much. Uh, I'll do a little behind the scenes. I said, Hey mama, can you call Gail? <laughs> Uh, I'll fully admit that, guys. You know, I have no shame. I have no shame. Find us every Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, on 365 Sportscast radio streaming service. Download the app. Makes it crazy easy to listen. 